What's the hereditary algebras? Lecture 8. Examples. Category O. We start with the setup. Let G be a semi-simple, finite-dimensional, complexly algebra with a fixed triangular decomposition into the negative part n minus, Cartan subalgebra H, and the positive part n plus. For example, we can take as G the Lie algebra SLN of all traceless n times n matrices with complex entries. So here n is greater than 1. In this case, we can choose as the Cartan subalgebra H, the subalgebra of all traceless diagonal matrices. As the positive part n plus, we can choose the subalgebra of all strictly upper triangular matrices. And as a negative part n minus, we can choose the subalgebra of all strictly lower triangular matrices. We denote by capital R the root system of the pair G, H, and by W the vile group of this root system. We also denote by pi the basis of R, which corresponds to our choice of the positive part n plus. Now we can define the bernstein gilfand gilfand category O. For a Lie algebra A, if we denote by U of A, it's universal enveloping algebra. And we note that the categories of all modules over the associative algebra U of A and all modules over the Lie algebra A are naturally equivalent. In fact, they are naturally isomorphic. Definition. We define the bernstein gilfand gilfand category O associated to the above triangular decomposition as the full subcategory of the category of all U of G modules that consists of all modules M, which satisfy the following three conditions. First of all, M is finitely generated. Then, the action of the Cartan subalgebra H on M is diagonalizable. This means then M has a basis which consists of common eigenvectors for all elements in H. And the third condition is that the action of the positive part on M is locally finite. This means that if we take an element M in M and apply to it the universal enveloping algebra of the positive part, the outcome should be a finite dimensional vector space. This category was defined in the original paper by Bernstein, Gilfand Sr. and Gilfand Jr. with the title A Certain Category of G Modules. This paper appeared in 1976. All modules in category O are weight modules. So let's now define the general notion of weight modules. Consider the dual space H star so this is the space of all linear functionals on the Cartan subalgebra. For an element lambda in H star and the G module capital M, denote by M sub lambda the set of all elements M in our module M on which elements from the Cartan subalgebra act as the scalars which are prescribed by the functional lambda. In other words, M lambda consists of all common eigenvectors for the Cartan elements, where the eigenvalues are prescribed by the element lambda in H star. Elements in H star are called weights, and the corresponding M lambda are called the corresponding weight spaces. For a module M, we define its support as the set of, of all weights, such that the corresponding weight spaces are non-zero. And the module M is called the weight module, provided that we can write it as a direct sum of its weight spaces. In particular, a module is a weight module if and only if the action of the Cartan subalgebra on it is diagonalizable, which means that all modules in category O are, in fact, weight modules. Now we can define the main protagonists of the story of category O, and this is the notion of Verma modules. Let lambda be an element in H star. Consider the one-dimensional space over the complex numbers, 
as an H module on which the elements of H act via this scalar lambda. So this is a one-dimensional H module which corresponds to the element lambda in H star. If we set that the positive part kills this one-dimensional space, we turn this one-dimensional module into a module over the algebra H plus and plus. Now we can define the Verma module delta lambda as the module which is obtained from our H plus and plus module C lambda by induction all the way to U of G. So we take U of G and tensor over U of H plus and plus with C lambda. Here are some basic properties of Verma modules. Each Verma module is a weight module. This is because it is generated by the H module C lambda, so which consists of weight elements, and a module generated by weight elements is a weight module. Moreover, all weight subspaces for any Verma module are finite dimensional. One can write an explicit formula for the dimension of this weight space using Costan's partition function. Furthermore, the weight lambda subspace in the Verma module delta lambda has dimension one, and all those weights for which the corresponding weight subspaces are non-zero have the following form. So if delta lambda sub mu is non-zero, then lambda minus mu can be written as a linear combination of positive roots with non-negative integer coefficients. So this suggests that we should just define a partial order on H star via this condition. So we write that mu is less than or equal to nu if and only if the difference between these two weights is a linear combination of positive roots with the negative integer coefficients. And then the support of any delta lambda consists of all elements mu, which are less than or equal to lambda with respect to this partial order. And in particular, it follows that lambda is the maximum element in the support. And this is usually called the highest weight. So this, this is the reason why Verma modules are usually called highest weight modules. Now we can talk about simple highest weight modules. The module delta lambda is generated, more or less by definition, by the element 1 tensor 1. And this element is a basis in the weight space delta lambda sub lambda. In particular, any proper submodule n of delta lambda satisfies that n sub lambda is equal to 0. Because n sub lambda has 1 tensor 1 as a basis, if it's not 0, the corresponding weight space generates the whole module M. So all proper submodules must have the properties that N lambda is zero. But then if we add up any number of proper submodules, we cannot change this condition. So this means that any sum of proper submodules of delta lambda is proper. And in particular, this means that delta lambda has a unique maximal submodule and has a unique simple quotient which is usually denoted by L lambda. Being a quotient of a weight module, L lambda is a weight module, and of course, lambda is the unique maximal element in the support of L lambda. And because of that, L lambda is usually called the simple highest weight module with highest weight lambda. It is very easy to see that for any lambda, both the Verma module delta lambda and its simple quotient L lambda belong to O. Moreover, any simple module in O is isomorphic to L lambda or some lambda in H star. Let us look in more details into the SL2 example. Consider the Lie algebra SL2 with a standard basis consisting of the element F, this is the lower triangular matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, the Cartan element H, that's the diagonal matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1, with trace 0. And the upper triangular element E, this is a matrix 0, 1, 0, 0. Then F is a basis in the negative part N minus. H is a basis in the Cartan subalgebra H. And E is a basis in the positive part N plus. 
Note that in this case, H star is isomorphic to complex numbers. It has dimension one. So therefore, weights are just complex numbers. If you take a complex number lambda, the Vermont module delta lambda has a basis, which consists of elements V sub lambda minus 2i, where i is a non-negative integer. And the action of f, h, and e in this basis is given as follows. The element v lambda is an eigenvector for h with eigenvalue lambda. The element v lambda minus 2 is an eigenvector for h with the eigenvalue lambda minus 2, and so on. The element f maps v lambda to v lambda minus 2, v lambda minus 2 to v lambda minus 4, and so on. And the element E maps V lambda to 0, V lambda minus 2 to lambda times V lambda, V lambda minus 4 to 2 lambda minus 2 times V lambda minus 2, and so on. In particular, it is easy to see that if lambda is not a non-negative integer, then delta lambda is simple, and hence it is isomorphic to L of lambda. And if lambda is a non-negative integer, then delta minus lambda minus 2 is a submodule of delta lambda, and L lambda is the quotient of delta lambda by delta minus lambda minus 2. In this case, L lambda is a simple finite dimensional SL2 module of dimension lambda plus 1. A very important property of category O is that it is abelian. The proposition Category O is an abelian subcategory of G mod. Proof. Of course, it's very clear directly from the definitions that O is a C linear category. Next, we know that O admits finite direct sums. Indeed, we have to check the three conditions in the definition. And of course, finite direct sums of finitely generated modules are finitely generated. Finite direct sums of H diagonalizable modules are H diagonalizable. And finite direct sums of un plus finite modules are un plus finite. Next, category O is closed undertaking quotients. Indeed, quotients of finitely generated modules are obviously finitely generated. Quotients of H diagonalizable modules are obviously H diagonalizable. And quotients of un plus finite modules are un plus finite. And finally, Category O is closed undertaking submodules. So the first thing here is non trivial. Submodules of finitely generated modules are not usually finitely generated. But in our case, the algebra U of G is Noetherian, and therefore, submodules of finitely generated modules are indeed finitely generated. Of course, submodules of H diagonalizable modules are H diagonalizable. And submodules of U n plus finite modules are U n plus finite. And combining all this, it follows easily that category O is an abelian subcategory of G mod. Next, we need to discuss the decomposition of category O with respect to central characters. Denote by Z of G the center of the universal enveloping algebra. Each element in Z of G acts on delta lambda as a scalar. This is because it acts as a scalar on the one-dimensional highest weight space. And then since the module is generated by that weight space, we get the claim. In other words, each Verma module admits a central character, which we denote by chi lambda, and that's an algebra homomorphism from Z of G to C. Since this property is preserved by quotients, it follows that each element in Z of G acts on L lambda via the corresponding scalar prescribed by the central character chi lambda. Let us denote by rho the half of the sum of all positive roots. Then we can define the dot action of W on H star as follows. So w is the while group of the root system, so it acts on H star in the obvious way. But now we can shift this action by rho, so we define W dot lambda as W applied to lambda plus rho in the usual way, and then subtracted rho. This is necessary to formulate the following theorem by Harish Chandra. 
We have that the two central characters chi lambda and chi mu are equal if and only if lambda belongs to the dot orbit of mu. Moreover, any central character can be realized as the central character of some verma module. Now we can use the central characters to decompose category O. For a central character chi, let us denote by O chi the full subcategory of O, which consists of all modules on which the kernel of chi acts locally nilpotently. Then O decomposes into a direct sum of these O chi's, where chi goes through the set of all central characters. It is very easy to see that any module in O is a weight module with finite dimensional weight spaces. In particular, from here, it also follows that the dimension of the home space between any pair of modules in O is finite. Another corollary is that each module in O chi has finite lengths. Consequently, each module in O has finite lengths. And to sum up, each O chi is an abelian c-linear length category with finitely many simple objects up to isomorphism and finite dimensional home spaces. A warning, the category O chi might be decomposable. There is no claim that it is indecomposable as a category. But there is one important thing which is missing in the previous sum up, and this is the question whether O has enough projectives or not. And indeed, O has enough projectives, as follows from the following theorem from the original paper of BGG. Category O has enough projectives. Of course, it is enough to prove the claim for the category O chi for some fixed chi, and let lambda be such that the dot orbit of lambda corresponds to this central character chi. Let us fix some element mu in H star and let n be a positive integer. Define the module Q, which depends on mu and n, as the quotient of the universe enveloping algebra of G by the left ideal, which is generated by all elements of the form H minus mu H, where H is a Cartan element, and the nth power of the positive part n plus. So we can choose n big enough such that mu plus n positive roots doesn't belong to the union over all nu in the dot orbit of lambda of the set of the form nu minus a linear combination of positive roots with non-negative integer coefficients. So if n is chosen in this way, then the projection, which we denote by P, it depends on chi, mu, and n. And this is a projection of Q, mu, n onto O chi. So this projection has the property that home from this projection into any module n in O chi is isomorphic simply to taking the weight space with the weight mu in N. So this follows easily from our choices of mu, n, and chi. But this means that the functor of taking home from this module p chi mu n is exact on O chi, because taking a weight space is an exact functor. And this means that this module is projective in O chi. And now if we take as mu w dot lambda for some element w in w and the corresponding n, which will depend on this w, we will see that there is a home from this projective module to LW dot lambda by definition, because taking home from this module is to take the weight space of weight W dot lambda, which is one dimensional in this module. And this means that this simple LW dot lambda has a projective cover. And since any module has finite lengths and all simples have projective covers, the standard arguments show that any module in O chi has a projective cover. Consequently, the category O chi is equivalent to the category of modules, of finite dimensional modules, over some finite dimensional associative algebra, which we denote by A chi. 
the standard description of module categories over finite dimensional algebras tells that as a chi, we can take the opposite of the endomorphism algebra of the direct sum of indecomposable projective covers of simple modules in the category of chi. Now we can talk about simple preserving duality. Proposition, the category O has a simple preserving duality, which is denoted by star. Proof. Let sigma be an anti-involution of G, which fixes H pointwise, and swaps N plus and N minus. For example, we can take the anti-involution, which is given by transposition, or SLF. Then, recall that each M in O can be written as a direct sum of its finite dimensional weight spaces. Consider as M star the direct sum of duals to these finite dimensional weight spaces. Then we can define the left action of G on this vector space using our anti-involution sigma. And since sigma preserves H pointwise, we will get the module with exactly the same support as the original module M. And then it is very easy to see that this module M star belongs to our category O. And so taking the star defines a contravariant anti-equivalence on category O. But here it is very important that we do not take the dual of M. Modules in category O are usually infinite dimensional, but we write M as a direct sum of finite dimensional weight spaces and take their duals. So this allows us to get a contravariant functor which squares to the identity. And of course, this functor preserves the support of a module and so it preserves the isomorphism classes of simple modules because they are uniquely determined by their support. In fact, they are uniquely determined by the highest element in their support, by the highest weight. Great. Now we can formulate the main theorem for today's lecture. Fix a central character chi and consider the finite dimensional algebra A chi. That's a finite dimensional algebra whose module category is equivalent to O chi. Let us fix some linear order, denoted by the symbol, on the set of isomorphism classes of simple modules in O chi, which extends the partial order less than or equal to on the set of highest weights, or simple highest weight modules in O chi. Theorem, which is due to Bernstein, Gilfand, Gilfand in the original paper, the category O chi is a highest weight category with respect to our linear order. And in particular, A chi is a quasi-hereditary algebra with respect to the same linear order. This should be A chi, not A chi mode. Standard objects with respect to this structure are Verma modules. So let us prove the theorem. To prove the theorem, we need to check that Verma modules, so the choice of Verma modules as standard objects for the structure, satisfies two axioms. First of all, the Verma module delta lambda, it surjects onto L lambda, and the kernel should have composition subquotients which are strictly smaller in our order. Indeed, the highest weight lambda, both Verma module and L lambda, have one dimensional space as the highest weight space. And in particular, it follows that the multiplicity of L lambda in delta lambda is 1. The kernel of the projection from delta lambda to L lambda has support, which consists of mu, where mu is strictly smaller than lambda. And therefore, any simple L nu appearing in this kernel satisfies that nu is strictly smaller than lambda. It satisfies that nu is strictly smaller than lambda. And by definition, this implies that nu is strictly smaller than lambda in our linear order. And this proves the first axiom for standard module. So for the second axiom, we need to prove that projectives have a filtration with Verma subquotients. First of all, we note that if we look at the category F delta, so that's a category of all modules which have Verma flag, Lemma, this category is closed under taking direct sums. 
proof. By construction, each Verma module is free of rank 1 over the universal enveloping algebra of n minus. Moreover, it's a weight module, so it is also graded by its support as a module over n minus direct sum with the Cartan subalgebra. Therefore, a module from category O belongs to F delta if and only if it is free of finite rank over U n minus, because modules in O are also automatically weight modules, so they are graded by their support. And this property is clearly inherited by direct sums. So the freeness of graded modules is inherited by direct sums. And this proves our lemma. So now we can go back to the second axiom and show that all projective modules have a Verma filtration. Of course, it's enough to prove this for indecomposable projectives. And by our construction of projectives, each indecomposable projective is a summand of some module of the form Q mu comma n. So it is enough to show that our module Q mu comma n is in F delta for any mu and for any n. This is due to the lemma from the previous slide. And if you look at the proof of that lemma, we see that it is enough to show that our module Q mu comma n is U n minus three. But the fact that this module is U n minus three follows directly from the poincare birkhoff witt theorem, because when we define these modules, we put some conditions on the Cartan elements and on the elements in N plus, but no conditions on the elements of U n minus. And since the universal enveloping algebra is free as a module over U n minus by the PBW theorem, it follows that Q mu n is U n minus free. And this completes the proof of the main theorem. As a corollary of the main theorem, we have the following classical BGG reciprocity. Let us denote by P of lambda the indecomposable projective cover of L of lambda in category O. Theorem, the classical BGG reciprocity from the original paper by BGG. For all weights lambda and mu, the multiplicity of delta mu in a Verma flag of P lambda is equal to the composition multiplicity of L lambda in delta mu. And this is just the classical BGG reciprocity for quasi-hereditary algebras, which have a simple preserving duality. Here, we just formulated in the original setup of BGG, where it was formulated and proved. So this happened before quasi-hereditary algebras were introduced. And now let us look at the SL2 example in more detail. So we consider SL2, and let chi be the central character of the trivial SL2 module L0. The while group of SL2 consists of the identity element and the sign change, and this acts on the one-dimensional complex vector space. We have two roots, 2 and minus 2, and so the weight rho, this is one half of the sum of the positive roots, it equals 1. And so the dot orbit of 0 consists of 0 and minus 2. So minus 2 is not a non-negative integer, and so delta minus 2 is equal to L minus 2. But 0 is a non-negative integer, so delta minus 2 embeds into delta 0, and L0 is just a quotient of delta 0 by delta minus 2. So in particular, we have that the multiplicity of delta 0 in P0 that's the multiplicity of L0 in delta 0 is 1, while the multiplicity of delta minus 2 in P0, that's the multiplicity of L0 in delta minus 2, that's 0. So this means that P0 is just the Verma module delta 0. About minus 2, we have that the multiplicity of delta 0 in P minus 2, that's the multiplicity of L minus 2 in delta 0, this is 1. And the multiplicity of delta minus 2 in P minus 2 is the multiplicity of L minus 2 in delta minus 2, that's also 1. So the projective module P minus 2 surjects onto delta minus 2, and the kernel is delta 0. And now we can draw the Loewe filtrations for both projectives. So P0 is delta 0, it has L0 on top, and L minus 2 in the socle. And P minus 2, it surjects onto delta minus 2, which is L minus 2, and the kernel 
is delta zero. So this is zero and minus two coming from here. So these are the projectives. And we see that we have one home from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, and we have one home from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So our algebra A chi is the pass algebra of the following quiver. So we have two vertices, zero and minus two. The arrow alpha from minus two to zero, which corresponds to the home from which send this top to this socle. And then we have the arrow beta, which corresponds to the home from P0 to P minus two, sending this zero to this zero. And of course, alpha minus beta is zero. So if we go here and then back, we get zero. So our algebra A chi is the path algebra of this quiver with this relation. Okay, some extra problems and questions at the end. Number one, explain why declaring that n plus kills c lambda, c lambda is a one-dimensional h module where h acts via lambda, why this defines on c lambda the structure of an h plus n plus module. Problem question two, prove that any G module generated by weight vectors is a weight module. Problem question three, prove that any module in O has finite dimensional weight spaces. Problem question four, prove that the duality star is a well-defined duality on O with O details. And problem question five, in the SL2 example, compute the projective module P minus two explicitly meaning provide a basis in this module and the action of generators for SL2 in this basis. Thank you very much and see you next time.